we'll be looking at the different types of pathogens and the diseases that they cause. We'll be focusing on how those four pathogens actually make us ill and uh, actually looking at some examples of how uh, the pathogens can be spread either directly or indirectly in animals and plants. So the first pathogen we're going to look at is bacteria. So bacteria are prokaryotic cells, meaning that they don't have a nucleus, but they do have naked DNA in their cytoplasm and also plasmids that can sometimes give them extra genes to help with their survival, such as antibiotic resistant genes. But in terms of how they actually make us sick, uh, the main thing that they do is that they produce toxins. So toxins can be chemicals that could, uh, let's say for example, interfere with the uh, enzyme reactions, uh, let's say by inhibiting certain enzyme action. So what they can do is by stopping those reactions, it may mean that the body can't actually break down uh, toxic chemicals, so leading to a buildup of them, and uh, perhaps it could be resulting in the lack of certain important protein productions. So uh, either way, it can cause a massive issue. Tuberculosis is, a, uh, is an example of animal bacterial disease. So the main thing that tuberculosis does is that it damages uh, the lung tissue, so causing lots of uh, respiratory issues. Whereas in plants, the example would be ring rot. Uh, so a lot of times they target potatoes, tomatoes, and aubergines. And uh, the main way that the bacteria works, it, it damages the leaves, for example, that stops the photosynthesis from happening. And it can also target the tubers of, for example, the uh, potatoes or, and fruits as well. So it targets those areas in particular. The next one that we're going to look at is fungi. So fungi are eukaryotic uh, organisms. And uh, one of the main things that they do is that they can spread by making spores. So a lot of the uh, organisms that get infected by fungi is usually uh, as a result of coming into contact with the spores and once the condition is right, they will actually start reproducing. Now there are two ways that fungi can actually make us ill. Similarly to bacteria, they can also produce toxins uh, and working in several different ways. But apart from that, fungi uh, are also saprophytic organisms, meaning that they can actually release enzymes out of them to digest cells. And obviously, as they digest the cells and the chemicals, it will actually break it apart, uh, causing a lack in cells and function. A typical example of animal fung fungal disease would be uh, the athlete's foot. There aren't that many animal fungal diseases, but this is one of the classic ones, uh, which is a situation when the fungi are found uh, in the warm and moist areas in the foot, let's say, for example, between the toes, and it will start actually digesting some of the cells and the skin there uh, and causing lots of itches and uh, pain in that area. Whereas for plant fungal diseases, Black cicatoka will be a, an example that you need to be aware of. Um, similarly to most plant diseases as well, it destroys the uh, leaves in particular and actually causes black lines that goes across the leaves. Same thing, they destroy the chloroplast, meaning they can't photosynthesize, reducing the amount of glucose made and obviously uh, the rest of the functions will be impaired. One of the main targets of black cicatoka will be uh, banana plants. The third pathogen we're going to talk about are viruses. Now, the main way that viruses uh, actually cause us to be ill is that they take over uh, cells and use the cell's own resources to reproduce. So one of the classic ways is that the viruses will inject its own DNA or RNA into the cell uh, and the DNA or the genetic material will then embed itself with the cell's own DNA. And as the cell is going through DNA uh, replication, or perhaps through protein synthesis, it will start making more viral DNA or even viral proteins, and then the virus will be able to assemble itself within our cells. And once there are enough viruses made within the cell, it will burst from inside out uh, in the process causing the cells damage. And that is also a reason why uh, there are not that many medicines that could target viruses because in order to get to the viruses, you will have to make a medicine that destroys your own host cells, which obviously will make you ill in the process. AIDS would be a classic example of a human or animal viral disease. Uh, and the main thing about AIDS is that it is actually called the acquired immune deficiency uh, syndrome. So it's a situation when the T helper cells within our body, which is a type of white blood cell that you'll learn later on in this chapter, and the T helper cells are basically uh, messengers. They kind of are the first line of, um, you know, they're the first white blood cells to detect a, uh, an attack. Uh, 
and actually it's able to then signal the rest of the immune system to start producing antibodies, etc., to start to uh, try to kill the pathogens. However, with AIDS, the virus HIV uh, will target the T helper cells, meaning that when the T helper cells are actually destroyed, they are not able to send signals to the rest of the immune system to try to defend the body. And that is why usually uh, for an AIDS patient, uh, the, the key pathogen that actually causes a massive problem isn't the HIV itself, it's usually um, a, an issue with the infections by other pathogens that the body is not able to defend itself against from. Tobacco mosaic virus will be a plant viral disease example. So as the name implies, it targets to, uh, tobacco plants, uh, sometimes also uh, tomatoes and also peppers as well, and, and actually a bunch of other plants. It is probably one of the most common um, diseases that affect plants. And the key thing is that they produce uh, these mosaic patterns of discoloration on the leaves. Discoloration means that it's losing its green color and it turns it yellow or brownish. And that would mean that the chloroplasts are actually destroyed. Again, lack of photosynthesis, lack of glucose, etc. The last pathogen that we'll look at is protist, and or sometimes called them protoctista in terms of its in terms of its Latin name. Now, protist also hijack cells to reproduce, but on top of that, they can also actually digest cells as well. Uh, and one of the key things or key example that you need to be aware of will be malaria. Now, malaria is caused by um, the protist uh, that is usually transmitted by a vector, which is female uh, Nepalese mosquitoes. So female mosquitoes actually suck uh, human blood, whereas male mosquitoes feed off um, fruit juices. So in, the, in this case, uh, what will usually happen is that the protist will be able to reproduce inside the uh, mosquitoes, but then it can be transferred into the human's bloodstream as the female mosquito feeds off the blood. And what happens is that as the protist enters the bloodstream, it is able to hide within the red blood cells and the liver cells and starts reproducing inside them. So in a very similar way as uh, the way that the viruses work. And obviously that will cause damage uh, and in the red blood cells and the liver cells causing lots of issues as well. As for plant protist diseases, the classic example will be potato blight or late blight. As the name implies, it targets potato plants and also tomato plants. And are actually similar to how the ring rot uh, bacteria works, it, will able to, it is able to uh, damage the leaves, tubers and uh, fruits as well, uh, causing a lack of glucose or food storage, such as starch. So that is a summary of the four different pathogens, how they make us ill and some examples of the diseases. So now let's look at different methods of transmission. So largely, in regardless of animals and plants, there are two ways that pathogens can be transmitted, which is direct and indirect. So direct means that the pathogen goes from one organism straight onto another, whereas indirect transmission is referring to how the organism would, put, uh, would transfer the pathogen onto a surface or another object, which then is uh, that which then is transferred into another organism um, as the second organism actually comes into contact with that object. So for animals, there are three methods of direct transmission. So the first way is direct contact. Uh, so this could be skin on skin contact, or perhaps uh, there is some sort of direct transmission of bodily fluids. So for example, kissing or perhaps unprotected sex would also be an example of direct contact. Inoculation is another example of direct transmission. Uh, inoculation means that there is an opening, for example, there is a wound on the hand or parts of the body where the pathogen can enter. So let's say, for example, you had a paper cut uh, and the pathogen was able to enter the bloodstream before the blood clots, or perhaps sharing of needles, uh, especially between drug uses, or perhaps uh, during blood transfusion uh, that has um, that has happened without checking the blood and screening the blood to ensure that it doesn't have any pathogens in it, that will be an example of inoculation as well. The third method of direct transmission would be ingestion, which is the scientific term for eating and drinking. So for example, eating contaminated food that was um, that has come into contact with pathogens or perhaps undercooked food or meat um, or drinking water that is not clean, those are all examples of ingestion. As for indirect transmission in animals, there are also three ways that this could happen. 
First is fomites. So fomites are referring to uh, inanimate objects that the uh, infected individual comes into contact to, and then, uh, and, and let's say a healthy individual then uses that particular fomite or object that results in the transmission of the pathogen. So for example, it could be someone's coughing and they coughed on in their hands or they're sneezing into the hand. They didn't clean their hands afterwards and then they use their hand to open the door and that transmits the pathogen onto the door handle. And then another individual came along uh, grabbing the door handle as well and then for whatever reason licked his hand or, or you know rubbed their hands uh, into their eyes etc that is a way of entry for the pathogen or perhaps it could be uh, someone with athlete's foot and they were wearing pairs of um, you know flip-flops and then someone else comes along and wear the same flip-flops again without cleaning in between that is another example of fomites transmission the second method is a very, very uh, common way that pathogens can transmit, which is droplet infection. So when someone coughs, sneezes, or perhaps talking really loudly, that releases droplets into the air. So those droplets um, actually contain lots and lots of pathogens in them. And if someone inhales those droplets into their system, then obviously that would uh, result in infection. So a lot of diseases can be transmitted by droplet infection, such as the common cold, flu, or uh, COVID is another classic example here. The third method of indirect transmission would be vectors. So vectors are referring to, in this case, uh, animals that could transfer the pathogen from one animal to another. So an example would be the female Anopheles mosquitoes that I mentioned earlier that results in the transmission of malaria. So as the mosquito sucks blood off of a uh, patient and then flies off and sucks the blood of a healthy individual, that they then transfer that uh, protist into the healthy individual's um, bloodstream. So that is how vectors can transmit diseases. So now on to how plant diseases can be transmitted. For um, direct transmission, for plants mostly it is just direct contact. So when the leaves of an infected plant uh, comes into contact with the leaves of a healthy plant, they can then transfer any pathogens throughout that particular process. So vectors would also be an example of indirect transmission for plants. Uh, so examples could be, let's say, insects like aphids when they are sucking the um, uh, the sugar sap in uh, in the stem of a of a plant that could result in the transmission of the pathogens through the aphids as they suck the uh, sugar sap from another plant as well. Or humans could become vectors when we are, let's say, using an axe to chop down a uh, diseased plant and without sterilizing that axe, we use the same axe on another plant uh, that could also result in transmission of the pathogens. Sometimes actually the wind or water could also act as vectors as the pathogens can travel through them. Let's say a fungal spores can be transmitted by the wind or the water landing onto another healthy plant that could also result in an infection. Another way would be contaminated soil. So let's say for example, uh, someone discovered that you know, their farmland is, uh, all of the plants have been infected by uh, a particular pathogen and they removed all of the plants from there. But without changing the soil, they used the same soil and then planted new plants in there. Then obviously any pathogen that is actually staying in the soil can then infect the new plants that were just transferred to that area. So it's really important to change the soil um, after you've removed a diseased plant or even just sometimes you can leave it there and not use that particular area uh, for, uh, for a certain amount of time and making sure all of the pathogens actually have died completely before using the soil again. So those are the few different ways of uh, pathogen transmission in animals and plants. So now that we've talked about the different uh, methods of transmission, uh, there are actually several ways that um, the transmission rate could be affected. So here there are four particular ones that, uh, that are quite common. First is the hygienic conditions. So this could be in animals could be about uh, the personal hygiene or it could be the hygiene of the environment that they're in. So obviously, uh, if you are living in a, an area that is not clean and not hygienic, obviously that would result in a higher chance of you getting, a, getting infected by disease. 
Perhaps having a naturally weak immune system could also be a, a problem as well, obviously, because that would mean that your body will be less able to fight off the infections, more and um, increases the chance of you transmitting that disease from one person to another. So this could be a result of different things. It could be because of uh, HIV infections that results in AIDS, but it could also be uh, some something that a person is born with. Overcrowding would be another reason, uh, similar to the uh, reason for high... Uh, poor hygienic conditions, uh, being crowded in an area would mean that any if anyone is infected in that particular crowd, it's very easy for that pathogen to be transmitted. So this is often the case in certain farms that in order to uh, save cost or increasing the meat production, they will keep the animals in very, very closely packed areas to ensure that you know there's less heat loss uh, if they're huddled together and making sure that all of the energy that they take in from the food is all used to build their muscles instead of moving around. But that would mean that they are more susceptible uh, to infections because they're all so close together. Another really commonly mentioned one is uh, genetic variation. So it could be that certain organisms have natural susceptibility, meaning it's kind of like the concept of having a weak immunity, but um, maybe more specifically in plants, when certain plants are more susceptible to infections, whereas others are less susceptible because of their genes. So there you have it. That is a summary of the different pathogens and the diseases.